Good evening, everyone, and welcome to ADL's Legislative Update Part 1. I am thrilled to have all of you with us, and I understand that many of you likely have a debate on the House floor going on either next to you or in your ear. And while it is an important, important issue, um, tonight we are going to be focusing not necessarily on voting. We'll focus on that in our next legislative session. I wish that we could be advocating together in person this evening, but ADL Austin, ADL Southwest based in Houston and ADL Texoma based in Dallas have been working so hard this session to really focus on fundamental rights related to our mission. You know, there's an, there's an old saying that the founders of Texas did us all a favor when they created the opportunity for session to only meet every other year. However, they make up for it in lost time. And in 20, some ways, 2021 is so very different than any session we've ever seen. In a pandemic where testimony, hearings, interactions look so very, very different, coupled with the challenges of Snowmageddon, both with the suffering that went all over our state, as well as the recovery efforts. But in some way, the 87th session of the legislature looks exactly the same because the challenges, the protection of Texans' fundamental freedoms is work that all of us have to do every day. And while I appreciate each and every one of you for logging on tonight, I also wanna thank you for your advocacy work. The response rate that ADL, in addition to our coalition partners have had from people calling, writing, and interacting on the issues of today have been absolutely tremendous. ADL's advocacy work has always been based on the secret sauce that advocacy is best when done with partners, partners who stand with us on the issues that matter and we stand with them on the issues that they are most effective at advocating for. I encourage you to participate tonight, to drop your questions into the chat because we have a fabulous, fabulous panel who will be able to answer questions that I don't know you'll have the opportunity any other time to get such great resource information. We are so fortunate at ADL to have our advocacy work led by our Jean and Jerry Moore Southwest Regional Council, Rachel Bresner. Rachel's incredible legal career has led her to very to us to be very very lucky as she manages a civil rights portfolio for our entire central division including the three texas offices i appreciate each one of you being here tonight and rachel please take it away and introduce our esteemed panel thank you cheryl and thank you again to all of our attendees for joining us for adl texas's legislative update I'm so pleased to be your moderator for tonight's program with our amazing panelists. Texas's 87th legislative session began on January 12th and it is in full swing. Um, as Cheryl said, um, I know many uh, on the call are um, participating and also in the other ear um, listening to debates or are actually at the Capitol right now. So um, it has already been a wild ride. ADL Texas has taken action on um, over 30 bills so far this session in areas including online hate and harassment, voting rights, religious freedom, LGBTQ plus equality, anti-Semitism, anti-Asian hate and immigration. And we're monitoring hundreds of other bills in various areas. As Cheryl said, we could not fight hate in the Lone Star State without our numerous coalition partners. And we are so grateful for all that they are doing this session. There are many ways uh, in which this legislative session in Texas looks and feels different than sessions in the past. And that is not only limited to pandemic related protocols and obstacles. This year, we're seeing a concerted effort in states across the country to push through hundreds of pieces of legislation in several core areas, including bills that expand or restrict voting rights, affect LGBTQ plus rights, and allow the use of religion to discriminate. That same trend is playing out here in Texas this session. As many of you are aware, there have been hundreds of bills filed this session in Texas aimed at expanding and many restricting voting rights and access to the ballot. 
And while this is an area that ADL and our partner organizations are particularly involved in this session and particularly involved in even tonight, as um, there's a debate going on the House floor related to SB7 and HB6 right now, we will not be covering voting rights legislation tonight. Instead, please join us for part two of ADL's legislative update, which will focus solely on voting rights legislation with, I hope, a good outcome from tonight on Wednesday, May 19th at 6.30. We only have an hour to highlight several areas and pieces of legislation that are moving quickly through the legislature that could bring profound change to Texans. Tonight, we're going to hear from an esteemed panel who are working on the front lines in Texas this session and focus on proposed legislation related to online hate and harassment, anti-Asian hate, religious freedom, and LGBTQ plus equality. So with all of that in mind, let's get started. I'm thrilled to introduce our esteemed panelists. State Representative Jean Wu is here with us. He proudly serves the people of District 137 in Houston in the Texas House. Prior to being elected in 2012, he served as a prosecutor in Harris County, in the Harris County District Attorney's Office, where he sought justice for thousands of crime victims. Representative Wu is currently an attorney in private practice. And since being elected a representative, he has focused on improving the lives of Texas children. Representative Wu has authored numerous pieces of legislation, including several we're gonna talk about tonight, and has specifically fought the school to prison pipeline and passed a comprehensive CPS reform bill in the 85th legislative session. Now in his fifth term, Representative Wu has been appointed to serve on the Appropriations Committee and sits on the subcommittee on Article 3, which is responsible for the funding of our state's education system. Representative Wu also serves on the Juvenile Justice and Family Issues Committee, bringing his expert knowledge and professional experience to help represent kids and families across Texas. Outside of his legislative work in his remaining free time, Representative Wu remains active and involved in the Houston community, where he currently serves on several community advocacy organization boards and serves as guardian ad litem, representing minors in court in criminal and CPS cases. Representative Wu is passionate about supporting young people becoming active in civil roles, and we are so pleased to have him here. Thanks for being here, Representative Wu. Thank you so much. Next, we have Carissa Lopez, political director for Texas Freedom Network a nonpartisan grassroots organization of more than 130,000 religious and community leaders who support religious freedom, individual liberties, and public education and focus on several issues, including education, textbook censorship, religious freedom, LGBTQ plus equality, and reproductive rights. Carissa grew up in Garland, Texas, and moved to Austin in 2010 to attend the University of Texas, where she graduated in 2013 with a BA in government. Carissa got her start in community activism in college, where she worked with the Texas Freedom Network student chapter at UT to organize her fellow students and register them to vote. Immediately after graduation, she was invited to serve on Texas Freedom, Network, Texas Freedom Network's board of directors and work for the Texas Democratic Party on their fundraising and events team. She has since organized union members and lobbied the Texas legislator, legislature for workers' rights with the Texas Employees Union and serve as the executive director for the Travis County Democratic Party. Krista has dedicated her life to working on policies that will make a real and positive impact on Texans' lives. Thank you, Krista. And last, but certainly not least on our panel tonight, we have Ricardo Martinez, who is the CEO for Equality Texas an organization dedicated to securing full quality for LGBTQ plus Texans through political action, education, community organizing, and collaboration. Ricardo is a first generation immigrant from Mexico who grew up in Brooklyn, New York, and was the second person in his immediate family to graduate high school and the first to earn a bachelor's and master's degree. Ricardo has amassed over 17 years of nonprofit fundraising, organizing, advocacy, and leadership experience, 
with organizations like Pencil, Summer Search, GLSEN, and Stanford Children. Ricardo has an undergraduate degree from Stony Brook University and a master's degree in nonprofit management from the New York from the New School in New York City. He was honored by the Obama administration as an emerging LGBTQ plus leader in 2012 and recently awarded Stony Brook University's 40 Under 40 Award for the impact that he's had in civil service and activism since graduating from the university. Whew, what a panel. Thank you all again for being here tonight. Before we get started, I just wanted to remind our attendees that you can post questions um, in the chat box and we will get to as many as possible after our initial discussion is complete. So let's get into it. As part of ADL Backspace Hate Campaign, this session ADL's three Texas offices uh, located in Austin, Dallas, and Houston have been focused on advocacy to increase access to justice for victims and targets of online harassment by filling and closing gaps in the current laws. Two areas of focus in Texas law have been swatting and doxing. Swatting is the malicious act of creating a 911 hoax, typically involving false reports of hostages, gunfire, or other extreme violence, with the goal that emergency responders will be sent to the target's residence or place of work. The purpose is none other than to weaponize emergency response systems to harass and intimidate innocent individuals. Doxing is the posting of a person's private or, per or personal information as a form of harassment with the intent of the information be used to stop or harm the targeted individual. And it sometimes involves releasing a private phone number or address and inciting harassment and violence against them. Representative Wu, we are so grateful to you for your leadership this session in filing anti-swatting and doxing legislation stemming from ADL's Backspace Hate Campaign. Can you talk to us about what motivated you to introduce these bills and the progress of these bills so far? Um, well, thank you so much. I, I really appreciate y'all uh, taking a, a, an interest in this. This is actually, um, I think a very important issue that I've, I've been aware of. I'm, you know, I'm one of the younger uh, members of, of the legislature. Um, I have, you know, I kind of cut my teeth on the internet and I know just from my, my experiences, uh, you know, on, on social media and other places that uh, the swatting is real. Um, I actually had to explain to a lot of members what, what it was, um, but I've seen firsthand that it happened on social media sites and I've seen examples on, on, on different platforms. Um, and it's a really serious thing. And um, I, at first, I think people kind of took it as a joke and oh, this is a rare thing, but over time, squatting has really become um, a tool of terrorism. Um, and, uh, you know, I think the other easy answer is because y'all asked me to carry it. And that was very grateful uh, mm -hmm. because we it's sort of like our, our stars aligned and I had an interest in it and you guys had the bill, had the language ready. And so um, I was very happy to work on it. And, you know, uh, having been a former prosecutor, and, and now uh, still working in the criminal justice world, um, you know, I, I was very happy to do it. And it's, it's good, it feels good to fix a wrong. And I think this is a, one of the things where we're fixing a wrong because there exists existing law about uh, making fake 911 calls, but those are really just minor slaps on the wrist uh, compared to the actual damage and harm and, and death and destruction that is caused by squatting. Absolutely. Thank you so much. Um, we are hoping that especially the squatting bill, which is moving through the legislature, that it will close those gaps in the current law. So thank you again for yep. your leadership on this important issue. Yeah, and in fact, um, um, I'm sorry, let me just give you a quick update. The bill, um, the, the Senate version has come over. We voted out of the House committee. Uh, it's headed to the local consent calendar. And once it's done there, it, it should be um, off to the governor's desk soon. Really exciting. Thank you again. You are also a strong advocate for the Asian American and Pacific Islander community across Texas and across the entire nation. In this session, you also filed a resolution condemning the rising tide of hate targeting 
the AAPI community since the beginning of the COVID-19 pandemic. Can you speak to the issue and what you hope that the resolution will accomplish? Yeah, thank you so much. And uh, I have to have to give a big shout out to the ADL um, because, you know, when the Asian American community came under attack, I think the, one of the first groups that came to our defense was the Anti-Defamation League, was, uh, was the Jewish community. Because I think, the, I think we all of us very quickly realize a lot of the same hate that's directed towards anti-Semitism is the same type of hate um, that's directed to the Asian American community. And I, I think I've said this again and again publicly, hate is hate. Um, it doesn't matter the, what the name of the victim is, but it's the same type of hate that's directed to everyone. It's just, just, it's just the name of the victim that changes over time. And, you know, in the past, they might have found Jews or people of Hispanic origin or Muslim Americans, and now it's time for Asian Americans. And, you know, the victims have changed, but the people who perpetrate this, the people who instigate the hate is this, are this are always the same. And the reason for my resolution is actually very simple because it is literally, literally the least we can do as a legislature because it is simply a recognition that there is hate, there, there is violence against the Asian American community, that this is not a joke, that we're not making this up. Um, and the unfortunate thing is there have been leaders, there have been leaders who have called it a, a hoax, uh, leaders who have called, told us it was overblown, uh, leaders who told us don't worry about it, it's just one incident. And the Asian community over time has felt ignored, has felt invisible, has felt like we're just on our own, our own now. And why the resolution is important is because it's an official statement from the legislature to acknowledge that there is hate, to acknowledge that there is violence, and to acknowledge that the fears that the Asian American community have are legitimate and real and should be addressed. It, this is the absolute lowest bar. This is the absolute least we can do. And I'm hoping, I'm not even 100% positive that this resolution will, will make it out. Um, but I'm still, we're still working on it and we're hopeful. And again, I am so grateful. And, Asian, and I share the thanks of the entire Asian American community to the Jewish community, to the Anti-Defamation League for your immediate and absolute support. Um, thank you so much. Well, thank you so much. Um, we're really proud and honored to be able to stand with you and the AAPI community. Um, one of ADL's core principles is that you can't fight hate against one group without fighting hate against all. And so um, we're, really, we're really honored to be able to do that and stand with you on this resolution. Carissa, we're gonna turn to you and to um, the next um, major focus area that we're seeing this session. Texas Freedom Network works tirelessly to safeguard religious freedom, whether in the minority or majority, a commitment that is shared deeply by ADL. This legislative session in Texas, we, as we have seen in the past, and there's no surprise, there are efforts to chip away at that wall separating church and state. And um, new religious exemption laws being proposed across the state. Can you talk about the latest legislative efforts that are being advanced this session under the guise of religious freedom that Texas Freedom Network is focusing on? Sure, thank you for having me. Um, I am also a little all over the place. I'm also at the Capitol tonight for the big fight. I wanna thank Donna, Representative Donna Howard's staff for housing me and letting me have some of their spark, caffeinated sparkling water tonight. Um, but what, we work on a lot of issues and one of them is uh, one of our bread and butter issues is fighting these religious exemption laws. Cause that's what they are. They're religious exemption laws because they are giving exemptions um, to individuals, businesses, uh, who want special treatment, we already have religious freedom in this country. Um, and so they want an additional exemption from, from that. Um, but some of the bills, you know, we've, there's been a lot of bills targeting um, various pockets of re religious exemptions. We saw it in 2017. We saw 
um, them discriminating against people that wanted to adopt. Um, and last session we saw them attempting to discriminate against anybody, allowing discrimination to anybody um, that had a license, a state license. Um, and this year we're seeing medical professionals um, and lawyers actually as are the two big bills that we're seeing that where they want to give a license to discriminate to. Um, House Bill 1424 uh, would give a license to discriminate to any healthcare professional. This includes a doctor, nurse, hospital staff, et cetera, to refuse to provide any treatment or medical procedure based on their sincerely held religious belief, right? Um, and then we have uh, Senate Bill 247 and House Bill 3940, their companions, which um, seeks to prohibit the State Bar of Texas from creating any rule or taking any action that would limit or interfere with an attorney or bar license applicant's freedom of religion or belief. Um, so both of these bills are currently, they've passed the Senate and are currently waiting um, in the calendars committee on the House side. And so we're working really hard with our partners like Equality Texas uh, to make sure that these bills don't make it any further because they are not, law, are not law yet. And they, um, we, we very much can and should defeat them. Um, you know, religious freedom is one of our nation's founding values and is already protected by the Constitution, uh, but that's not what these bills are about. They're a part of a years long effort to carve out special exemptions that allow individuals and businesses to use religion as a license to discriminate. Uh, and we know that that shouldn't be uh, constitutional, you know, it shouldn't be allowed. Like I said, we already have religious freedom in this country. We don't need that extra protection. And in fact, it's just a license to discriminate. And we know that for the most part, a lot of these laws are targeted towards LGBTQ people. Um, sometimes they're targeted towards uh, reproductive rights, uh, but a lot of the times they are targeted, even if it doesn't say so explicitly in the bill. Um, and so, you know, we're, we're not gonna let them get away with it. And we've you know, been successful, we were successful last session and we're um, working really hard to make sure we defeat them this session. Thank you, Krista. Is there anything different um, this session? I know the bills are, um, you know, different shades of the same from session to session. Mm -hmm. Is there anything that Texas Freedom Network is doing differently this session to um, oppose these exemption bills? I mean, this session is different in a lot of ways. <laughs> um, you know, we are, uh, we're having to get very creative with our advocacy. Um, this is the last couple of days have been the first couple of days that I've actually been in the building for long periods of time. Um, and uh, thankfully I'm, I was, I'm able to be fully, was able to be fully vaccinated. So I feel comfortable, um, but we, uh, you know, we're, we're having to get creative with our advocacy. I think, um, you know, just like, like always, though, we are working closely with our partners. We don't do this work alone. Um, you know, we're we're seeing um, new leadership. We're seeing a lot of new members. Um, there's we saw after last session too. There really is a turning tide on the for some of the Republicans to be come out more in support of the LGBTQ community. And so we're hoping that they continue that pattern and um, will work with us to defeat these bills. Thank you. Also this session in Texas, as well as across the country, we're seeing bills filed seeking to exclude places of worship from the reach of emergency orders related to public health issues or even disasters. Despite various courts, including the United States Supreme Court weighing in on this issue, the bills continue to move in the legislature. How has um, Texas Freedom Network been responding to these bills and how has the Texas faith community been uh, getting engaged on this issue? Yeah, sure. So we are, there's a, the big bill that's moving is Senate Bill 26 with its companion House Bill 1239, which, you know, like you said, um, you know, we saw doesn't, doesn't allow places of worship to be closed in, in uh, during a disaster declaration. Um, and because as a response to Republican Governor Greg Abbott's uh, executive orders around COVID-19. Um, you know, I, I think that everybody has a right to worship in this country and in this state, but 
when the middle of a disaster in the middle of a public health emergency, um, I don't think that they should be exempted. Um, and we, you know, the TFN and the, the faith community that we work with, you know, they've been getting creative and one voluntarily, a lot of them have been not hosting for a long time in person services because they know that the, the health of their communities um, is at stake. Um, and, you know, we've seen, like always, the religious right is coming out really, strong for this because they don't be they believe that this is a huge infringement on their rights but uh, in, in fact it's really just a matter of public health um, and so you know we we've been working with them we've been working with these communities I think you know of <laughs> it, it is an uphill battle on on this one um, I mean they're all uphill battles but this one especially um, because you know at, everybody thinks that this is a really big deal um, on the Republican side. And I think, you know, we're, we're, we might see this one actually become law. And I really hope that this doesn't have uh, detrimental effects on the public health of the state of Texas. Thank you so much. I know it's a lot and I really <laughs> appreciate you being here and hiding out, especially from the Capitol with all of this going on. Uh, Ricardo, I'm going to turn to you um, to talk about more uh, record-breaking legislation. Um, 2021 has been a record-breaking year for legislation across the country attempting to roll back protections for LGBTQ plus individuals with a majority of these bills affecting and targeting transgender youth. Can you talk about what you're seeing across the country and in particular in Texas this year? I can. Number one, I just want to say thank you uh, for having me. Thank you uh, to, for including me with Carissa and Representative Wu. Uh, I ran into both of them today and I've been seeing their work from afar uh, during legislative session. And I know how hard they're working. So thank you both uh, for including me uh, in such great company and for being such an incredible partner in, you know, supporting some of the, the bills um, that are good for the LGBTQ community, but also pushing back on the ones that are uh, destructive um, and uh, limit our protections as people. Um, in terms of the landscape uh, nationally, 2021 is slated to become one of the worst years for LGBTQ plus state legislative attacks. We have an unprecedented number of states that are poised to enact record chattering number of anti LGBTQ measures into law, but just the the sheer amount of bills that have been introduced, uh, I think, uh, puts this uh, year into the record books as probably the worst uh, for LGBTQ equality. Uh, specifically here in Texas, we have 36 anti-LGBTQ plus bills this year. And this is not something that we should be proud of, but Texas is number one uh, in the total number of anti-LGBTQ bills and number one in the total number of anti-transgender bills. Um, filed uh, in a state legislature. Uh, and these bills range from allowing discrimination under the guise of religious freedom, uh, efforts to undermine non-discrimination policies and protections, legislation like you mentioned um, that target our transgender community, uh, specifically transgender student athletes, and also um, trying to prohibit youth from accessing gender affirming medical care and um, criminalizing that uh, care that is carefully um, provided in consultation with families and doctors, right? And so amongst very many uh, is this SB 1646, which would classify gender affirming care as child abuse, um, with, and also would make applicable um, the, the felony that corresponds and the jail time that could be, uh, that could correspond with that as well. Um, just to give you a sense of just how much of an escalated attack it has been uh, on LGBT equality. In 2019, we only fought 19 bills. Um, this year, we're, we're fighting almost double. And that is an incredible escalation and direct attack on the lives of LGBTQ people. And this is unacceptable. Um, and it's also based on non-existent and baseless um, emergencies, right? We see this session after session where 
instead of focusing on actual problems like fixing our electrical grid or addressing public education or providing access to medical care, we're once again addressing these fictitious emergencies that scrutinize the lives and bodies of transgender people. And, you know, what I want to underscore here is that we're okay with, well, I'm not okay with, but some lawmakers are okay with focusing on these fictitious emergencies, but we are one of the leading states with an actual emergency, the murders of black and brown transgender women, right? That has not been addressed. And uh, over the course of the last month and a half, there have been three additional uh, women who have succumbed to violence um, and that has not been addressed. And so it, it's just a shame that we have to be here and be here now um, and experiencing this trauma time and time again. And I feel very heavily for our parents and our advocates that are having to go into the Capitol this often, um, which is in itself an act of courage and then having to take the additional risks associated with coming into the Capitol um, with a uh, raging pandemic still happening, right? And so uh, it has been an incredibly tough session. I know Carissa knows it. I know that Representative Wu knows it. I know that the ADL knows it. And um, it's just profoundly sad. It is. Um, and on that point, um, these bills in particular have been getting increasing media coverage and generating online discussion, not just in Texas, but across the country. And you touched on it a little bit, but can you speak to the impact of these bills session and session, you know, time and time again, just being introduced, um, particularly the impact on Texas's youth and families in the state? Sure. I think, number one, these bills represent a really cruel effort to further stigmatize and discriminate against LGBTQ youth across the country, right? This time we're putting um, we're putting a target in the backs of trans people and trans youth specifically who just simply want to live, right? They just want to be themselves. And I think there's no, no, uh, there's no bigger or greater um, goal to live your life authentically, right? And so um, to, to put a target on the backs of transgender kids when they really are just trying to live their authentic lives, I think is again, profoundly sad. And when we scrutinize the lives of trans people, we know, and I know that ADL understand this very well, that that fuels bias, it fuels fear, it fuels racism and discrimination um, in our society and amongst our youth and transgender kids are the target, right? And so we, as you said before, we don't have to wait for these bills to pass to actually see the harm. I recently received a letter from a physician in Arkansas who detailed uh, just the devastating impacts that legislative attacks in Arkansas uh, were having on her practice, right? And so this doctor has provided gender affirming care for years. And in her, in her practice, she's never uh, experienced or um, had to experience the, the, the tragedy of uh, her patients attempting suicide. And since that Arkansas law passed, three of her students have succeeded at committing suicide. And that is what's at stake here, right? Lives are at stake. Um, but that's not only, that's not the only thing. That's not how it's only trickling down, right? Two weeks ago, there was a school teacher from Katie who frantically called Equality Texas asking us to do something about this pervasive bullying that she was seeing at her school. And she's been teaching for 16 years. And this is the worst that it's ever gotten. And the target, again, is trans students, right? And that's not, that's not the only case. We have countless cases that come in every single day. Last week, we received an email from a mom who was told by her lesbian daughter that her bullies threatened to shoot all the LGBTQ kids in schools. That is not a safe environment or nurturing environment. Imagine having to worry about your safety and not focusing on your actual schoolwork, right? It's, it's, and it's not only LGBTQ kids. A couple of weeks back, a cisgender young woman was publicly harassed by a man who decided that she was transgender just because she was too tall, too fast, too strong, right? And so I, I just want folks to know that we, we share these examples because the harm is done. The harm is done. These bills do not have to pass for kids to be in crisis, right? And every single time that we debate LGBTQ bills at the Texas legislature with a partnership with Trevor Project, we know that calls to crisis hotlines increase from Texas area codes, right? And so 
we we don't have to wait for tragedy to stop these bills and understand that they they're not good for Texas, they're not good for youth, and they're not protecting anyone. Thank you. It is heavy, and I know <laughs> many people are going to leave tonight's program feeling um, that heaviness of what's going on in Texas right now and across the country, as I said. Um, we do have some questions coming in, so I'm going to turn to those from the attendees. I did just want to mention that Representative Wu did have to jump off because of the debate on the House floor, but if attendees do have questions for him, please send them our way and we're happy to, um, to, to get them to him and streamline that process. Um, so I'm gonna open up this question, Krista and Ricardo, to both of you. Um, which bills are you the most worried about moving in the next uh, three and a half weeks? I think definitely, especially like the ones that we talked about, we talked about them because they are moving. Um, I think that uh, there's the anti, especially the anti-trans sports ban that we're seeing, um, SB 29, um, it's the Senate bill that the House bill has also already been heard in committee. We are hoping that it doesn't get voted out of the House Public Education Committee. Both of those religious exemption bills that I mentioned um, have passed the Senate um, and they are sitting in the calendars committee, which is the committee that sets the, that decides what goes on to the house floor. So there's a committee of members there that you, um, that does make those decisions. Um, and so I think, you know, we brought these up because they are, they are moving and I, we would like need all of the help that we can get. And I'm happy to put the bill numbers and I'm sure Ricardo is too. Um, and, you know, we need to, you to call your legislators, contact your legislators, contact the speaker members, the, the House Public Education Committee members, the calendars committee members. And it's a lot of legislators I'm naming off, but they all have a lot of power to stop these bills. Carter, do you want to add anything? <laughs> uh, I just muted just so that I wouldn't um, interrupt or say anything out of turn. <laughs> no, you um, should. <laughs> I'm trying to be as respectful as possible because Carissa knows I can get really excited. Um, no, I would just say, I, I fear all of them, right? And obviously some have more momentum than others, some have moved beyond the, um, but anything could be expedited, right? And so, yes, there are things that are emergent, like dumpster fires, and then there's things that are moving that are just of concern, and they're all of concern to me, and I won't be um, relieved of that concern until May 31st, right? And so, as Carissa said, HB 1399, HB 1424, uh, HB 610, SB 1646 that we mentioned before, SB 1311, um, those are all worthy of concern. Um, and we we can't relent, right? We have to be relentless in our pursuit of justice for the next 25 days. I know that some folks are um, somewhat optimistic because some bills have been stopped. Um, maybe they're stalled um, at their respective committees, but, uh, we still have to put the pressure on. We still have to hold folks accountable to represent us and the people that we love. And that means calling and calling again, getting three people to also call, like getting your friends to call, having a, a call party, volunteering with TFN or Equality Texas, right? There are so many ways to plug in between now and the end of session. Um, and so if, we, if you don't follow TFN on Twitter, you should, or uh, Instagram and the same for Equality Texas. I know that we live tweet, and then we put a lot of the advocacy stuff that we're doing or focused on every single day on Instagram. Mm -hmm. Thank you both, and I'll echo that for ADL as well, and I know we've been weighing in on uh, all these bills that you're mentioning too, so um, for the ADL constituents on the call, please open your emails and um, <laughs> take action when you're asked. Um, and same thing, follow social media. That's the best way. Things are happening so quickly that sometimes the first place that you, you hear about something happening is on Twitter. Um, so you mind if I add something question? really quick? Yeah. So I want to, the people are tired, right? Advocates are tired. This has been an incredibly taxing session for so many people. And so when people tell me like, does my voice matter? Yes, absolutely, 100%, right? Your voice and your story could be the reason why a legislator changes their mind about an issue, right? 
you can hear something 30 different times. And it's just that one person that's able to just hit home and help you internalize a message in a different way that the other 30 people haven't been able to do. Um, and so, yes, call, call more than once. Um, it is never too late to get active in your advocacy. And if you need folks to hold your hand, I know our organizations, all of ours can do that. Thank you so much. Um, another question that we're getting is how has the COVID-19 pandemic and the capital restrictions and different restrictions in, in different chambers and for different committees, how is that affecting advocacy that you're seeing this legislative session compared to past sessions? <laughs> Go for it. You could start. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I was like, I'm sure our answers are going to be similar. Um, I mean, it's impacting everything, right? Yeah. I think it just depends on what part of session, right? At the beginning of session, we were being really cautious about asking people uh, to come to the Capitol and testify, drop cards, or be involved in any way because we understood that there was an associated risk, right? At that time, vaccinations were not that readily available, um, and people come were really scared, frankly, of just being becoming sick and. Although that there was a mask mandate at some point, it was loosely being upheld, right? And so um, when you're entering close quarters with folks, it's just a scary time. Mm -hmm. And so I think the more session has progressed, the more you've seen a willingness of folks co to come into uh, the Capitol building uh, in person, uh, masked, double masked, maintaining social distance. Um, and that has certainly helped. Um, but having to go, like build uh, in additional time at the very beginning of your day to ensure that you can get through security, that you get through your COVID test. Um, if you have a vaccination proof, then you can expedite your way into the building. But um, there are limits to how many seats uh, are available in the gallery and any of the hearing room. So it's just been um, difficult, right? And so for folks who do not want to travel, who have lost their jobs, who cannot afford to come to Austin from different parts of Texas, that's also a consideration, right? And so we have done our best to be able to make um, a portal available on, on our website to so that people can um, submit written testimony and we can print it out and deliver it in person. We are about a half a mile away from the Capitol. So for us, it's it's an easier lift. Yeah, and I would and say- to, oh, oops, sorry. No. no, I was just gonna say, I know that um, ADL is super appreciative, Ricardo, of Equality Texas doing that because they've done it for us several times and, and taken our testimony. So thank you for doing that. Yeah, I Go was ahead, just going to add like a lot of it to, you know, Ricardo mentioned some restrictions, but that's about it, right? There's it, it, what's what's unfortunate is that because there haven't been that many restrictions, people who are common sense, who actually take the, to take the virus seriously, have been cautious to come into the building, and very rightfully so. So we have seen, and and then you know, people who aren't taking it seriously tend to be on the more conservative side of of the issues, and we it, it's been really tough um, of you know, the genuine question, especially earlier in session, like Ricardo said, a lot more people are vaccinated. So um, they feel, are feeling more comfortable coming into the building, but it's been really tough because how do you make that choice of going to advocate, but also knowing that you can risk, risk your health. Um, and it's also no secret that this session, even, you know, when I talk to people who have been doing this for decades, that this is one of the worst sessions that they've ever seen. So we do see the, the leadership, I think, taking advantage of the fact that progressive advocates are, are not showing up in the numbers that they are. And then, but what are you supposed to do about that? Um, so it's been, it's been really tough, but we are, you know, Ricardo mentioned how they're getting creative and doing everything that they can in their power um, to make sure that advocates are still able to find a way to engage um, and find a way to make sure that they are contacting their legislator, getting their stories out there. Um, and so, you know, we, we've had to, you know, do some of those same things, um, but, you know, with a team effort. <laughs> I will add one thing that our opposition doesn't stay home, right? And so when we are bringing folks, the other bar barrier and challenge that we've witnessed is that 
people are being bullied, right? We've brought kids and their parents to the Capitol to testify on their own behalf and to share their story. Um, and we've seen children booed, right? Yeah. And intimidated. And that's really hard. And especially for an organization that fights for justice and equality for folks, like knowing that there's a, a possibility that that could happen is always, is always that risk, right? And you run that risk, but there's, there's really little that we can do about it. Mm -hmm besides not ask parents to come out as often, right? And that impacts our ability to, to fend off these bills. Right, and those personal stories are, like you said, can make the difference. One personal story can touch a legislature, a legislator and just change, change the game. So they're so important. What can attendees do to be supportive of the legislative efforts that you've both touched on tonight? You know, especially, in, in the age of, of COVID-19 and the pandemic, what can they do to make the most impact, whether it is from home or in person in Austin? I think um, there is there are still, we are in the last home stretch, but there are still some committee hearings happening. So if you're able to um, testify, um, you should, but the, the because of uh, COVID, the house um, has an online portal where you can submit online comments. Um, I think, you know, if the, I saw a question in the chat about what to do if you're outside of Austin. And I also think though, if you are outside of Austin, all of the things that we mentioned about contacting your legislator, contacting these certain committee members, you know, I'm from Austin. So I say this as an Austinite, like it's actually way more important if you're outside of Austin because Austin is way more engaged. So um, if you're not in Austin, like, we need you to please be engaged, especially um, because it's. They, I sometimes feel like sometimes the legislators think that they're only only hearing from from Austinites, um, and we know that Austin has a target on its back. Uh, so, really making the contacting those legislators, and even if you are from a, di a district with a legislator who is not on your side, and you're a community member, you should request a meeting one on one with them or their staff. You can do it virtually um, and tell your story and make sure that they're they're listening to you. Um, and I, I highly recommend that we've we've tried to to engage folks, especially our clergy members, um, with with their legislators and their staff directly, um, even via Zoom. That's in addition to all the things that we already mentioned. Yeah. Ricardo. I'd also just say, you know, for those of you who are able to donating to the organizations that are in the front lines doing this work is incredibly important. And I'm not just talking about the three organizations that are here. I'm talking about the Transgender Education Network of Texas. I'm talking about the ACLU. I'm also talking about HRC and Lambda Legal. There are so many local, regional, small organizations that could benefit from um, financial assistance. But if you can't do that, time, right? Volunteer, find a way to do it, whether it's virtually or not. Um, uh, that's incredibly important. And then just advocating in whatever way makes sense for you, right? Sharing a post, I think, is incredibly important to reach uh, beyond the bubbles that we have created in our our own advocacy, right? Um, and then making those calls are supremely, supremely helpful. Thank you both so much. Last question um, before we close. Uh, with everyone living more and more of their lives in the online space this year, uh, groceries, work, pretty much everything due to the pandemic, the spread of misinformation surrounding many areas um, and pieces of legislation um, is also increasing. How is that impacting your work at all um, and any of the bills that you're, that you're advocating on? I, I was just going to say that the dehumanization of people begins with misinformation, right? And so you be, and misinformation leads people to navigate the world based on assumptions that they've made about wrong information, right? So like people, there are actors out there, there are advocates out there who are believing lies. And all you have to do is really repeat a lie often enough so someone can believe it. And oftentimes... I mean, I do this myself too. I see something and I assume it could be factual, right? It's it's our, it, I think it's our, it should be our imperative for us to do our own fact checking as well, right? But I think in terms of the impact that it's having, when you can dehumanize people, it makes them an easy target, right? And so it, it helps divide so that um, what 
the discriminatory policies and bills that are being championed don't seem as bad, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's really hard to have a conversation with somebody who is just so entrenched in what they believe and no matter what evidence you show them to the contrary, they're just not gonna believe it. And it has, I mean, we've, I think that's how we've seen, you know, the state move farther and farther to the right. Um, and so, you know, what our organizations are working, what all these organizations are working on is fighting that uphill battle of combating that misinformation and moving the state away from that place. Um, but we can't do it without like a collective group of people that just say, no, this isn't true and, and, and fighting back against that. Um, but uh, we're working on it. <laughs> Like you said, uphill battle and um, <laughs> the job security is great because it is such an uphill <laughs> battle day in and day out. Thank you both. Um, I know at ADL, it seems like every week we're saying, wow, what a big week it's been at the legislature. Um, and I know that you both are feeling that sentiment as well. There are 25 days left this legislative session, but who's counting. I know Ricardo already <laughs> mentioned the days, so I know I'm not alone. Um, and there's so much left to do in this final home stretch. Um, for ADL, we echo what you both have said, and we ask that everyone on this call take the time to take action. When you receive action alerts, open them and take action. Call your representatives um and don't assume like ricardo said that someone else is doing the advocacy for you really make sure that you are doing it you're encouraging your family your friends your colleagues to speak out follow um adl and these great organizations equality texas and texas freedom network on social media retweet and share information that you know is accurate um and we all saw that the turnout uh, in 2020 for the election was so promising, and we know that democracy works through participation, and so we need you all to be involved. Um, if you haven't taken action up until this point, now is the time to do so. 25 days left, um, and we all need your help. Thank you again to our panelists and all of you who have shared your evening with us, especially while uh, some very important events are going on on the House floor right now. We really appreciate it. We hope to see you virtually May 19th for part two of our legislative update that's going to be focused on voting rights related legislation. Thank you all again and have a good night.